It may be more than half his lifetime ago, but when Beatles drummer Pete Best recalls the moment he was sat by the band, his voice still cracks. In this week's episode, he recalls the incredible experience of seeing John Paul and George performing together in the Casbah nightclub owned by his mother Mona and shares what it was really like to be with the group in Hamburg. I'm Laura Davis. And I'm Ellen Kerwin, and this is Beatles City Podcast. So, Laura, you were actually with Pete on Matthew Street? Yeah, we thought it would be a good place to meet him. His brother, Rogue Best, has been collecting items to do with the Beatles um, for many, many years now. And he eventually found a place on Matthew Street where he could have a Beatles museum. So it's the Magical Beatles Museum and it's over three floors and it's just packed with memorabilia. What kinds of things can people find in the museum? What's really exciting about it is that because this has been these items that Rogue has, has been sort of storing first in his living room and then in a warehouse. There are things that people just will not have seen before. And there are things that haven't even been photographed. So people won't necessarily know about them. So there's this ski jacket. It's, it's like amazing. It's black and red checked. And there's a kind of black frill along the bottom of it. And it's a jacket that the Beatles wore in Hamburg. But because it was never, ever photographed, nobody knows that they did. And it's absolutely pristine. And it's, and it's there on the wall for everybody to see. And this episode is going to be in two parts. Yeah, that's right. It was just so amazing listening to everything that Pete had to say. Uh, He talked to us for well over an hour. And then we also had a bit of a tour of the museum. So we thought that it would make a lot of sense to split it into two. So in this episode, he talks about seeing the Beatles playing as the Quarrymen in the Casbah, which was the nightclub that his own mum Mona had set up in the in the basement of their own house. And then he goes on to talk about the excitement of the days in Hamburg. And then next week, you'll hear about the really emotional moment that he was told that he would no longer be able to perform with the band. <laughs> Right, so I'm here with Pete and Rogue Best at the Magical Beatles Museum on Matthew Street. And we're just going to have a little look around at everything that you've got here and, and get your memories of the time. It'd be my pleasure. So can you remember the very first time you heard the Beatles play? Heard the Beatles play? It wasn't actually the Beatles the first time I heard them. I heard first George Harrison with the Legends, Stu Quartet, and of course Ken Brown was with them then. But the actual line-up that became the Beatles was the... Re- I suppose you could say now, the Reform Quarrymen, which was John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and George Harrison and Ken Brown, no drummer. And it was the night they opened the Casbah in 1959. That was the first time I actually saw them perform as a unit without a drummer. And then, of course, consequently, about 12 months afterwards, I joined them and we disappeared off to Germany for the first run. So what was the first night at the Casbah like? Oh, absolutely incredible. I mean, the kids knew that there was a, a rock and roll club opening in Liverpool. So even though we were scheduled to open at 7 o'clock, you know, doors opened at 7 o'clock to 7.30, uh, kicked off with Red River Rock. That was the signal that the, the club was due to open. By 6 o'clock in the evening, we had queues which went outside. If you know Haymans Green, OK, it's a detached property which stands, you know, on its own grounds. It went from the back door right the way up to the front garden, the front gates, and halfway down Haymans Green. So it was like a guaranteed audience. And they went on about nine o'clock at night, and the place just basically erupted. John turned around and said, we're going to play some rock and roll. And I think they blasted off with either Sweet Little Sixteen or one of Vincent's Bebop Luda or something like that. One of the standards. And the place just erupted after that. I was standing in the audience in case there was any problems, you know, sound-wise or anything like that. And uh, the kids were just mesmerised. And, of course, the second time they were due to appear, which was the following Saturday because it was a residency, the crowds were even bigger, which was wonderful for our mother Mona. So had you ever seen a reaction like that before? Not for a band. You know, I'd seen it with rock stars, you know, because we'd been to the Empire shows and, the, you know, when Vincent was on at the uh, Liverpool Stadium. But actually seeing it in the cellars of your own house, which has now become this great rock and roll club, you know, it was absolutely fantastic. The atmosphere was incredible. So where was your mum listening from? Mum was at the front door, or what we'd call the front door, was the front door to the club. And uh, she was there, she was uh, busy signing membership. But she had one eye on the money, one eye on the membership, and the other eye was listening and the listeners of the band, you know, to make sure everything was OK. I mean, it seems like such an unusual thing that a, a rock club opens in, in the house basement. How did it all come about? Well, it started, I suppose you could basically turn around and say, my mother was always interested in having a big house. And we lived in a semi-detached house in Queen's Court originally. And my other brother, Rory, uh, used to go to school at Marlborough College, which was in Haymans Green. 
And he came home one night and turned around and said to our mother Mona, I've just seen a house. It was an old conservative club, which is up for sale. Looks empty, derelict, but may take your you know, fancy because she always wanted to have a big house. So she said, I'll go down and see it. She took one look at it and fell in love with the property. And she went back and saw my father and turned around and said, I'm interested in buying it. And he turned around and said, I'm not interested. <laughs> it's a big white elephant, you know, so... She was a little bit disappointed, but the incredible thing, and this was the tenacity of the woman, right? Unbeknownst to us, she pawned all her jewellery, and she bet it on a horse called Never Say Die, which was a 33 to 1 outsider, being run, ridden by a novice jockey called Lester Piggott in the derby. And we were watching her, we were listening to the derby, and we saw Mona, we saw her reaction, as Never Say Die was getting closer to the post and winning, and it became more and more animated and more animated. And you didn't know it, it was only at the end of it. She basically shouted, I've won my house, I've won my house. <laughs> and then proceeded to tell us, you know, that she'd pawned the jewellery with that, the winnings. Uh, she had the money to buy the house. And she became the first woman in England to actually obtain a mortgage. So that's how we acquired the house. And then the rest of it, was she had an idea. She wanted to bring music to the kids of Liverpool. And she'd seen a programme on the television from the famous Two Eyes Club in Liverpool, in London. We were watching it and she turned around quite casually. Family was watching the television and she turned around and went, sellers are downstairs, aren't they? So we all said, yeah, because we used them as fun rooms, you know, the den for all the gang. Go down there and make as much noise as you can. She said, we said, yeah. So she said, I'm um, going to turn it into a coffee club. So we said, fantastic, you know, who's going to decorate it? Who's going to build it? You are. So we said, fine, that was the challenge. And we turned around and said, when are we going to start? And she said, tomorrow morning. And we started the following morning at nine o'clock. And within about six months, we turned the cellars into what later became the famous Caswell Coffee Club. And you were completely up for doing that? Well, yeah, it was a labour of love, to be quite honest. You know, when I mentioned it to all the friends, they were like, fine, we'll do it. Like, you know, so there used to be work parties which would be in there. Within a couple of weeks, I mean, back garden of Heyman's Green looked like a construction site. There was cement, timber, you name it, drills, sand, there's everything lying outside, you know, mountains of sand. Um, But we needed it because what used to happen, I'd finish at school, come back again, friends would finish work or they'd finish at school, and at six o'clock at night we'd all be down there. And Mo would have this constant supply of coffee and sandwiches for us, and that kept us going. She sounds like an incredible woman. She was. She was the first of her kind, I'll never be another like her. It was because of her... Their foresight, the kids of Liverpool got, you know, rock and roll and the Caswell became the catalyst for the Mersey Beat sound. What was she like as a mum? As a mum, she was uh, very open-minded, very candid. Years ahead of forward thinking, you know, liberal thinking, my friends had never seen anyone like her. And of course, when John George and Paul and Ken Brown met her for the first time, they were absolutely mesmerised. They couldn't see this woman, which she'd born out in India, English parents, but could hold them and intrigue them, you know, and sell this idea of the coffee club to them. She was one in a million, she was full of energy. I think you know. a, a wonderful accolade to Mo. I was with um, Paul at Abbey Road Studios and we were talking about my mother and Paul said, he said, can I tell you something? So I said, yeah, go on. He said, um, I've only met two people in my life that I consider to be special. So I said, all right. He said, who are they? I said, you want me to tell you who the two special people are? So he said, yeah. I said, right. I said, whoa. I said, well, one would have to be John. And he went, no, no. He said, John was fantastic. He said, but I didn't consider John special. So I said, no. I said, do you know what, Paul? I said, I haven't got a clue. He said, well, one was Linda. He said, and I married her. And he said, and the other was your mother. No, never met the like before or since. He said she was unbelievable. Now, Paul McCartney has met a lot of people. It's quite something, isn't it? And is this her behind us? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's a beautiful picture. Yeah, that's... she'd be 16 or 17 at that time. Uh, she was a beauty, as that picture portrays. You know, people that met her for the first time fell in love with her, fell in love with her, the way she looked, her approach, uh, her candidness. Plus the fact of beauty as well, you know. They used to call her the Oriental Princess. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the nickname. And then the kids basically at the Casbah, because she became, I suppose, you'd, for want of a better expression, an agony aunt. You know, all the kids that had a problem went to Mo. 
and she'd solve the problems for them. So she became mother to basically nearly every kid in the club that was a member, which is a fantastic accolade to the lady. So what was her reaction to you, you being asked to join the Beatles? Uh, very positive, to be quite honest. It was very much a case of I had my own little band, the Black Jacks, and she knew that I was dabbling in show business. And then, of course, I had no idea of going into it full time. You know, that was the furthest thing from my mind because I was going to become a language teacher. And then I got the phone call from Paul McCartney and, of course, everyone knows what happened after that. And when I went and checked it out with my mother Mona, she just turned around and said, son, if it's what you want to do, then go with our blessings. And I went to my dad and he turned around and said the same thing. He said, if it's what you want to do, do it. He said, but you're in Hamburg, be careful. And that was it. That was the philosophy. So I accepted Paul's offer and a couple of weeks after that we were on our way to Hamburg. So you auditioned formally for them, did you? you auditioned audition formally, them? yes. <laughs> um, auditions in those days, no one had basically used to do auditions. You know, we used to jump from band to band. One of the conditions was Paul turned around and said, when I said, OK, I'll, I'll go to Germany with you, he said, oh, we want you to audition. So I said, audition? He said, yeah. He said, bring your drums to the, the Wyvern Club, which later became the famous, you know, Blue Angel Club. I did, threw the drums in a taxi in those days, went off to the Wyvern Club, got there about one o'clock, set them up. The others were there, we blasted off about six numbers, just standard stuff. They went away in a corner and basically came back again 15 minutes later and said, you're in. With that, Alan Williams came through the door and they turned around and said, Alan, he was the man who was taking us out to Germany, uh, the first Beatles manager. And he said, meet Pete, the new drummer. And he said, I already knew Pete. He said, I'd seen him playing the Casbah. He said, I knew he was going to be the drummer. He said, because he's a good drummer. And he said, I will now tell him why we made him audition. So I turned around and said, I was going to ask you that. He said, we made you audition, just in case you were going to ask for more money. <laughs> so that was my indoctrination right. into the Beatles. Can you remember what you were paid back then? Oh, my goodness me. In those days, if we got £10 a week, that was absolutely incredible. I think that was about the standard living wage at that time. You know, what we used to pick up um, in those days was something like about £3 a night for a gig. Now, if that's amongst four or five people, doesn't boil down to an awful lot. So it was good pocket money for us. But of course, when we went out to Germany and we were offered £15 a week out there, which we thought was an enormous amount of money. So we went out to Germany and then we found we had to live off it, eat off it, survive off it. We get paid on a Thursday and come Friday morning and we were broke again. Yeah. <laughs> as simple as that. <laughs> Shall we walk over to the, more of the Hamburg years? Sure. When you went to Hamburg, had you been abroad before? Mm, I'd been on a school trip to France. That was about my total European experience at that time. So, like the other guys, you know, Hamburg was an experience for us. It was an adventure, it was an experience. We didn't realise at that time that we were going to be in the San Paoli area, which is the red light district. We soon found out, mind you. And, uh, you know, we made a veil of that, came to our advantage. Gave us a wonderful education at a wonderful, you know, at a very young age, uh, both musical and uh, living. It just turned out to be one hell of an experience because we didn't realise what Hamburg was going to be like. We didn't realise that we were going to be playing in the red light district, you know, the biggest red light district in the world at that time. Um, we didn't realise the clubs that we were going to be playing at. We didn't realise the hours that we were going to play. It was only when we got there and we got told we'd be playing. My goodness me, what was the first couple of engagements? Seven hours a night. Wow. Yeah, that we'd start at seven o'clock and finish at two o'clock in the morning. And that was during the week. Friday, Saturday and Sunday, we'd start at seven and finish at four. And we'd have 15 minutes off every hour. We used to turn them round. Um, because of the long songs we were playing, no one had a repertoire which is going to last seven hours non-stop. So we did things, you know, we, uh, we started, in, you know, Rehearsing songs which, you know, were all favourites. We started putting double solos in, in songs, making them longer. Where they'd be a minute and a half, they now end up being three minutes. The likes of What I Say, which is a big crowd pleaser. Some nights that could last half an hour, simply because of the fact the crowd wanted to be in on it. Well, you know, so it was half an hour, yeah. You know, We didn't realise it at the time, but that was developing us into this hardcore rock and roll outfit. You know, there was basically the best rock and roll outfit around at that time. And it was because of those long hours and because of the fact that we were, you know, we had to mock Shao as Bruno Koshmizer, who was the manager. 
kept shouting, Mok Xiao, Mok Xiao, you know, you're too animated, you're not animated enough. So we basically turned around and said, OK, we'll bloody well Mok Xiao, like, you know, so the whole act evolved then, you know, from stamping to jumping off pianos, John doing the splits, running around amongst the audience, you know, messing with them, mock fights on stage, you name it, we did it. But it just captivated the crowd. Yeah, you must have really got to know, got to know audiences and how oh, audience behave. And yeah, yeah. We, we, it was a learning curve for us. You know, we, our musicianship grew because of the long hours, our professionalism, and you know, increased. And the fact that we could read an audience and we could act, either turn it up, you know, when it was full, bring it down when it was empty, live life accordingly. So what did it feel like when you were on stage getting that reaction? We had to build it. I mean, the first time it was, to be quite honest, I'd never seen a reaction because I'd never played with them before, apart from, you know, the, the rehearsal and the one, one gig we did down at the Jacaranda. So actually seeing them perform on stage, it was a bit of a mixed reaction at the beginning, you know, because there was another band from Liverpool there, which was Derry and the Seniors, and they had a black singer, uh, Derry, who was basically made Little Richard look like a choir boy, you know. He was a great showman, fantastic showman. And, of course, that's what Bruno Koshmeder wanted us to be like, you know, but we couldn't be like him, you know, because we were, a, he was a frontline singer, we were static musicians. So that's how our act evolved, you know, it became absolutely, totally off the wall, stamping on stage, this, that and the other. But it captivated the crowds and we gradually won them over. And as the, uh, the reaction from the crowds was bigger and the screams were, and cheers were getting louder and louder, so the act evolved. You know, the more they screamed, the more we turned it on. <laughs> Simple logic, you know, it was show business. Give them the show, it's rock and roll. Were well, you were completely wiped out once you got off stage? Yeah, I mean, to be quite honest, um, at the end of the night, even though we never went to bed, um, the first thing that we wanted to do was head for the bar. You know, we wanted to relax, never bite to eat, and just basically have some time amongst ourselves, you know. Chat over, laugh about a few things which had happened on stage, but primarily you know, because it had been so hectic. And the 15 minutes off was basically what you were getting during, you know, uh, the, the night's performance. When you actually went for a drink and something to eat, it was relaxing time. We were ready just to go. <sighs> that was it. So did you talk about the, the gig or did you talk about other things? Or? Initially we did. And, and then to be quite honest, I suppose in a way we became a little bit blase. We saw the reaction. We saw what was happening with the crowds, the fact that, you know, the crowds were getting bigger, you know, the crowd, uh, you know, the club was getting fuller when we were on. Um, we were pulling people away from Derry and the seniors. They were coming to see us more than what they saw them. You know, so we were a household name. You know, we were basically become the number one attraction. And I, I, I think it reached the stage where we became a little bit blasé talking about it. The novelty and the excitement had gone. It was very much a case of now it was becoming a job of work. Really? Yeah, so. Even though we still had great times on stage, it was still excitement, you know, the adrenaline used to flow. But it became a job of work. But we had to entertain the crowds. And if we didn't entertain the crowds, we weren't doing the job. So we're stood in front of this amazing ski jacket. That's the ski jacket? Yeah, black this and one, red jacket. Black and red. Sort of black frill around the bottom would you say yeah this was pre-leather days okay I mean if you look at this the big picture over there you can see that it's uh you know that's the leather and the hunting jacket look the original outfits we went out in which were lilac stage jackets and black pants and black shirts within a couple of weeks they disappeared sheer hours on stage sweat just never lasted the course so we needed something, so we went to Peak and Kloppenberg, which was basically the equivalent of Hamburg CNAs. We found these. They look very rock and roll to us. There was a white one, that's red and black. There was a, another one, which was a black and white one, which got stolen. And uh, I managed to solve this one. Uh, and we wore them on stage. That became our stage outfit. Um, and we used to have pink caps, because we used to like Jean Vincent and the blue caps. So we saw pink caps there. There's one in the museum over there on the other wall. And, uh, you know, that was basically our outfit. You know, black pants, red and black ski jacket and the pink hats. So what made you keep it? Because at the time you probably didn't understand the significance of it. Oh, no, it was, it was a memento, wasn't it? I mean, it's not very often you, you know, you keep something. And it brought back so many great memories. 
even now when I look at people looking at it, the first reaction is, I don't believe you wrote things like that. You know, because they, they automatically imagine us in the leather image, which yeah. we transformed into. But there was a time when that was our stage outfit, and it brought back so many good memories. And they hung in the cupboard, and they hung in the cupboard. So Rogue said I want it. Yeah. And that's, that's how we so got there. I was going to ask Greg that we're surrounded by so many different objects, which at the time didn't have the same significance that they have now. So how come you've got them all? Well, the, the wonderful thing about the ski jacket we've just been talking about, in Beatles mythology, you see them, as Pete's mentioned, the lilac suit, the jack black pants, how that falls apart. And people have seen those photographs, so they, they know that's what the Beatles were wearing. Then the next thing you see is the Beatles are in leather. So it's assumed they're in these stage suits that fall apart, then they're in leather because it doesn't fall apart. You know, that's how they ended up in the leather. And there's never ever any mention of this period in between when they were wearing jeans, black and red, and white and black ski jackets. And there simply hasn't any mention of it because it was never photographed. And a gentleman was here the other day at the, here we go, the Magical Beatles Museum. He said, well, how did we know they were wearing them? I said, well, I'm glad you asked that. I said, because if you come and look at this letter, and that's the reason we've put the letter in the cabinet near the ski jacket, it's a letter responding to one of Pete's letters from Hamburg, from our mother, basically saying, I think the idea of you guys going into black and red and white and black <laughs> ski jackets is going to be really good. It's all about showmanship, son. Great. And of course, if people had seen photos of it, they wouldn't have seen it in all its red and black glory anyway. No, no, the no, no black. Uh, black and white photographs. Yeah. So was it a shock to the system returning to Liverpool? Yeah, it'd be simply because of the fact the way we came home, we were deported, Paul and I, which is far from the star's return. You know? <laughs> we were sent home courtesy of the German government as we turned around and said, the only enlightenment about that was that we flew. You know, that was the only saving grace about it. Coming back to playing Liverpool, yeah, it was a bit of a culture shock. Um, two things. Club which we should have played at, um, which was a top ten club, burnt down before we even appeared there. My mother heard about it and she threw us a lifeline. And that was when on the 17th of December 1960, the new look Beatles, um, and I turn around and say new look Beatles because of the leathers and the long hair and the cowboy boots and yeah. everything else that goes with it that people associate with the Beatles' early days. Played the first gig at the, the Casbah. It was a homecoming she built us with the fabulous Beatles direct from Hamburg. That particular expression got shortened down over a period of time to the Fab Beatles and then, of course, the Fab Four. So that, which came, that expression came from your mum? Came from my mum. She built us with the fabulous Beatles. There it is up on the poster, yeah. direct from Hamburg. And uh, it was quite funny because the night that we played there, Stuart stayed in Hamburg because um, he'd fallen madly in love with Astrid Kirscher, you know, the German art student photographer that everyone knows of photographs. And a friend of mine who'd been in the blackjack, Chaz Newby, stood in for Stu. He was playing bass for about four or five gigs. And uh, John, George and Paul went down into the cellar, you know, from the living room. And, of course, the crowd were all there and they looked very quizzically and sort of, that's John, George and Paul who used to be in the quarry men. OK, you know. Who were these fabulous beetles? And then salt in the wound. Pete and Chaz come walking down after them. And they go, that's Pete and Chaz who used to be in the blackjacks. Who were these fabulous beetles direct from Hamburg? So a large percentage of the crowd dashed out, but the place was jam-packed. When saw my mother moan and turned around and said, who are these beetles from Hamburg? She said, give them a chance. You know, they've only just come back from Hamburg. Listen to them. And we did. The place was jam-packed. We played. Silence at the end of the number. And then the crowd just erupted. There were screams that we... OK, put what would screams we'd heard in Hamburg into the nutshell. The place just lifted. And as I basically turned around and said, that was the start of Beatlemania. It started that night at the Casbah. And the kids went back to my mother, Mona, and turned around and said, oh, my God, Mo, we have never seen and heard anything like them. They are absolutely fantastic. When you got them back again? And, of course, as history portrays now, 
everywhere we played after that, we were sold out. You know, crowds were there, you know, hours before we even played. You still look really, like, lifted up and happy about Yeah, because it was, it was great times, it was exciting times. We conquered Hamburg. We'd come back, we'd left Liverpool as a very mediocre band from d several different sources. But we'd come back and the first gig, we'd stamped our, our authority in Liverpool. It spoke volumes to kids. The next time we played at Little and Town Hall, queues around the block, you know, and it just, just grew from that. So that first homecoming to Liverpool was special for us. A lot of excitement, the fact that overnight we became Liverpool's number one band. So it was another accolade to our crown. Little and Town Hall gets the, a lot of the accolade as being where Beatlemania began. But what you've got to um, faction into that, the night the Beatles played Little and Town Hall, Mo comes walking down into a Casbar coffee club <laughs> and finds that the club's empty and basically says, where is everyone? What's, what's happened? She's used to having this full club. And the lad working the door says to her, well, everyone's gone to Little and Town Hall to watch the Beatles. Now, for our mother, it was great. I gave them a shot. I gave them their first gig in Liverpool. And now they've emptied my bloody club. <laughs> <laughs> so the poster behind you, it looks really modern. I think it's very interesting. I suppose maybe we copy old posters now, I don't know. Yeah, it, it I think it's more like of... If you look around and look at some of the other gig posters, that looks much... More. Well, that, that's actually... Strangely, you're saying that looks really modern. That's actually the oldest poster here on the floor. That's one of the original ones saying that the lads were coming back from Hamburg. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I suppose it, it does... Um, looks modern, as, uh, as in modern posters, I suppose, are um, minimalistic now. Uh, there was a period where they were really busy, weren't they? Bands, posters, artwork and this, that and the other. Yeah, but uh, no, that's most definitely not... Uh, <laughs> de definitely not a busy poster. Yeah, but as you can tell, it was home-created. Look at it, you know, the artwork on it. Yeah, you know, because like we used that. to make our own posters, you know. Mo used to stay, the, you know, spend late nights after the club closed, you know, designing some of the posters and, you know, what colours she was going to use on them. Black and gold. Is she doing it at the kitchen table now? No? She did it at the kitchen table. She'd do it downstairs in the club when the club had closed, you know, on the coffee tables down there. Everywhere where she got a brainwave, she'd be doing something. You know, she was always active. Yeah. You know, that was the calibre of the woman. You know. Everything in the music industry now is so sort of officially done and it involves so many different groups of people and it's kind of lost that sort of handmade getting together and making it work sort of feel. I think it's evolved that way simply because of the fact of the speed of the industry now. You know, everything's within, you can have it and produce it within seconds. In those days, it was like a, I won't say around to say a long trek. There was more sobriety to it. You know, the speed wasn't as hectic, you know. So, yeah, you did have time, you know, times to plan things a little bit more. Even though once they actually started, it was still chaotic. You know, I mean, that was the beauty of it. You know, as we used to call it, it was planned mayhem, especially the Casbah. I mean, the crowds that we got down there and Mo, you know, in official capacity as, you know, club manager and head honcho, making sure that everything was OK and, you know, the musicians were OK. She was a popular person, you know, both with the kids there and with the musicians. You know, they used to spend more time before they were gigging, enjoying themselves, talking to Mo in the kitchen. And after the gig, it would be like, oh, we're going up to see Mo. Everyone was called Mo. Never Mrs. Best, always Mo. Yeah. And you, did you call her Mum, or because you refer to her as Mo yourself? Initially Mum, you know, but as you get a little bit older, it was Mona and then Mo. Mm -hmm. As we grew older, it just became Mo after that. Consequently, everyone who met her adopted the title Mo. The mother of Mersey Beast. Next week, Pete Best opens up about his personal relationships with each of the Beatles and he also recalls the devastating moments he was let go from the band. Yeah.